All right? So government can shape activities and not just do them. Government actually has three very different roles in the economy. It has police powers. For example, we insist on food being healthy. It can reshape markets. We can encourage and discourage behavior. And we can operate directly through the bureaucracy. And there are very different ways of doing things. Police power is when we say, we won't tolerate water that would poison you. We won't tolerate food being sold that will poison you. It's literally the government interfering and saying, this is a matter of, of, of criminality. This is a matter of law. And we'll use the state to enforce it directly. Second, we can shape the markets. So we have tax deductions. For example, if you have a very long tax deduction, which may be perfect for a steel mill, and you're in the age of software, and it, and it depreciates every 18 months, your depreciation rate, which is perfect for a steel mill, is five times as long as the software. And so you may literally want to rethink your tax code as you go into that. Uh, third, you have bureaucratic decisions. Uh, we're going to have a brand new program. Five bureaucrats will get together, and they'll pass out the goodies. That, in my judgment, is the least effective and the most politicized way for government to function, and is the one we should avoid as often as possible. Which is why I would suggest we want to replace bureaucratic government controls with achievement-oriented systems. And the three examples I'd give you are the Occupational Safety and Health Act, uh, or Health Agency, the, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Food and Drug Administration. In each case, I mean, one way to get safety is to hire somebody who becomes a bureaucrat who visits your plant and has a cookbook and they check off whether or not you're doing what the re regulations. Another way is to say, uh, if you have no accidents in your plant, we'll lower your taxes. If you have a lot of accidents in your plant, we're going to dramatically raise your taxes. People would then have a tremendous incentive to avoid accidents. And they would apply their human ingenuity to make sure that it was safe. And I'm just trying to give you that as a way of thinking about a very one approach is to say, we will hire somebody, they'll come inspect you. Now, the way we got to this, uh, did we talk in here one day about speed limits? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just go back to the speed limit model, because that, that was really for us the great breakthrough. That we Americans routinely look at a, at a speed limit and add five or ten miles an hour to the, to the posted number. Which means when you have an OSHA regulator walk in, your initial instinct is to resent them for being there. And then it is to figure out not how do I get to safety, but how do I get around the rules. And so you become rule focused rather than safety focused. A few weeks ago when Frederick Pena announced that uh, in the light of the recent uh, poor uh, period for airline safety, that uh, they were going, uh, there was a new, a new policy whereby we're in the, uh, the aim would be zero accidents. I had two questions. One was, what was the policy before? Ten accidents? <laughs> five? And the, uh, the second, uh, second question was, what was the incentive? There was no incentive. It was just a blanket announcement that we're going to go for zero accidents. Did, we uh, talk, did, did you and I talk about that? No. no. But, but I want to remember, what, what, we, what did we do when we did the Red Beat experiment? We tried for zero. We tried for zero. And how, and how do we communicate that to the workers? In the there you go. See, he still has it. Huh? <laughs> there it says, I'm a quality worker, remember? <laughs> See? One, you know, once the union steward, always the union steward. It's a... <laughs> and he's ready. But do you, do you see the model? That if all you're doing is exhorting, let's not have any accidents. What does that mean? Of course we're not. I mean, I, let me tell you, I fly off enough. I always think, I hope the mechanic did a good job. I hope the pilot's really excited about this. I hope they put the right kind of fuel in the tank. You know, I hope that the air traffic control system's doing right, and I hope the next airport's not fogged in. I mean, I'm big on this idea. You ought to get down the same way you got up, which is in one piece. Um, That's the way and, I like it. Huh? That's the way I like it. Right. But the idea that, that, that the way you get to that is you set incentives, you encourage the right behavior, you go through Deming's sense of a quality system. It's so totally different than having the next bureaucrat show up. And in fact, if you look at the best of, of the Federal Aviation Administration, it's cooperative, it's not adversarial. It sits down because the pilots, after all, have an equally big incentive. They're always the first ones to arrive at the scene of the accident. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> My father's a pilot. He said that uh, mothers will come up to him and say, you know, be careful. My son's on the plane. And then he'll tell them, well, you know, my mother's son's on the plane, too. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, and that's one of the reasons why aviation works so interestingly, because everybody has a vested interest in safety. 
And so but what you want is you don't want an adversarial role. What do I have to hide from? How are they going to try to regulate me? You want, a, you want a team effort where everybody gets in the same room and says, let's swap notes honestly, and let's find the right way to do this. It's very different than the government as adversary and regulatory bureaucrat. We also ought to frankly reshape incentives to regain a one generation lead in technological products. The examples I just list here are aircraft, space, biotechnology, materials technology, and computing. We should literally have as a national strategy how do we create the tax incentives and the other incentives so that we are consistently staying a generation ahead of the rest of the country, I mean the rest of the planet. So that when you, when you want to buy the best aircraft in the world, you buy American. When you want to buy the best computing or the best software or whatever, you buy American. And I think that's very, very important conceptually. Now, what I want to suggest to you, and this is what we, I've been working on for a couple of years that, that I'm trying to get into the national dialogue, uh, because it, it's so different than the way we normally think of it. I believe that health could be our biggest job creator and foreign exchange earner. Don't think of, and this goes back to the two models here for a second, do not think of health as problem, loss cost, lots of red tape. Instead, think of it over here as opportunity. What if the best health on the planet were in America, and everybody in America who got seriously ill decided that they would come to Americans for their health care, and the best products on the planet were American? And therefore, you consistently got diagnosed with American tools, you took American medicines. If you had a genetic effect, you used an American system of gene therapy. If you had a serious illness, you had an American do the uh, operation, and they might do it by virtual reality 12,000 miles away by satellite. Now, what would happen to cash flow? We would buy Chinese teddy bears. They would buy open heart surgery. And so you could and, and, and you'd have a huge assemblage in America a very high value added people. So that having the most specialists in the world wouldn't be a problem. It might well be an opportunity. Depends on how you, you see, if you think of it only inside the welfare state and you say, wow, we have too many specialists. So how do you know? One of the things you hear often in the welfare state model is there are too many CAT scans. Do you realize that there are more CAT scans in Washington state than there are in Canada? People say that like it's a problem. There are also more microwaves. There are also more cellular telephones. There are also more fax machines. There are also more VCRs. Why aren't the others a problem? Why? Because they're private and the price crashes. The only two places the price doesn't crash in the welfare state, and the only two places that technology does not crash in the welfare state are defense and health. So the only two places the government messes it up totally. In fact, there's an article, it's the cover of this week's Business Week, on the fact that you, know, you now get cellular phones as a giveaway. You know, what is it, Order Time magazine and we'll send you a phone? I want you to think about that, okay? Why isn't that happening in health technology? 